The Texas Supreme Court blocks the Dallas mom from getting an emergency abortion, but the court's order is raising more questions. When is the medical exception really going to allow life-saving medical care? How the decision could affect other challenges to the state's abortion ban. We have to, as leaders in the Democratic Party, encourage our Democratic leadership to work towards stopping this war. The question of a ceasefire in Gaza divides the top Texas Democrats running for Senate. We hear from the candidates about an issue that's causing friction for the party. Thousands of Texans looking for help after the state wrongfully kicked them off Medicaid. People are making really hard choices right now about do, what do they spend on Christmas gifts? Do they fix their car? How are they going to pay rent? Why there's now some encouraging news about efforts to restore those lost benefits. Produced from the Capitol in Austin and airing statewide, this is the award-winning State of Texas. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Monica Madden in for Josh Hinkle. The ballot is set for the 2024 Texas primary. Monday marked the deadline for candidates to file. One of the most watched races will determine which Democrat will face U.S. Senator Ted Cruz next November. Ten candidates are on the ballot, but two stand out. Congressman Colin Allred and State Senator Roland Gutierrez. Both men share similar positions on key issues, but there is one difference in their views on the war between Israel and Hamas. Both do support Israel, but Ryan Chandler found they have different beliefs on how Israel should fight and how the U.S. should support them. Dallas Congressman Colin Allred stopping short of calling for a ceasefire. This is a war of choice by Hamas. They chose this war. They are still holding over 200 hostages right now. They could release those hostages. They could lay down their arms. You are not calling for a ceasefire no, at this time? No, I'm not. I think he's out of touch with reality here. San Antonio State Senator Roland Gutierrez says Allred is out of step with Texas Democrats. He's calling for a ceasefire and says he would put greater conditions on military aid for Israel. Colin Allred needs to take back his position on this issue because we need to stop the killing of women and children. That's not who we are as a nation. <laughs> Since Hamas terrorists killed 1,200 Israeli civilians on October 7th, Israeli counterattacks have killed nearly 20,000 Palestinians, two-thirds of them women and children. That led the Texas Democratic Party to unanimously call for a ceasefire. I understand the complexities of the issue prevent someone from, uh, at this time, uh, Congressman Aldridge from supporting it. But from our perspective, we think that we have to, as leaders in the Democratic Party, encourage our Democratic leadership to work towards stopping this war. Senator Ted Cruz argues a ceasefire would help Hamas. He's calling for unequivocal support for Israel's defense systems. In the last several days, over 4,000 rockets have rained down on the people of Israel from Hamas. Their objective is to kill women, to kill children, to kill innocent civilians. Both of his top contenders supporting Israel and calling for greater protection for civilians. Israel has every right to defend itself, but they have to do that within the context of the laws of war. I'm not choosing between Israel or Palestine. I'm choosing peace. Ryan Chandler, State of Texas. We now want to take a deeper dive, not only in the Senate race, but other big state primary races. Joining us now is Jeremy Wallace, politics reporter for the Houston Chronicle and the San Antonio Express News and co-host of the Texas Take podcast. Thank you, Jeremy, for joining us. We also have our own Capitol correspondent, Ryan Chandler. Thanks, you guys. Jeremy's yeah. resume is a little longer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, uh, I want to start with you first and foremost. Governor Abbott has been delivering on his promise to uh, endorse some of the primary challengers to the Republican and Incumbents who did not, who voted against school vouchers and school choice at the end of the fourth special session. Um, you know, do you think that his endorsement is going to carry a lot of weight in these races? Generally, no, right? Because typically a, an endorsement from the governor alone isn't going to be enough to really sway voters. Uh, and he has done this in the past. But what may make this different than previous years is that he's like clearly much more fired up about this. And if they do start putting money into these races and really starting to flex a muscle, they sound like they're really going to put a lot more pressure on these incumbents than I think we're used to seeing from the governor's office. I'm not sure if his message is enough to dislodge them, 
but certainly they think that the polling is with them and they're going to go full bore and try to knock these incumbents out. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, you know, the House, of course, has become a battleground for Republicans. And there are some major splits that we're seeing between top leaders in terms of endorsements. Um, Ryan, how have you been seeing that shape out so far as we head into primary season? Yeah, you're right. There's at least 22 House races in which Governor Abbott and Attorney General Paxton have endorsed different candidates. They're waging their own kind of revenge tours in these primaries, but they have very different motivations. For Governor Abbott, it's all about education savings accounts, and he's endorsing against any Republican who voted against his top priority there. For Paxton, it's a lot more personal. He's endorsing against anybody who voted to impeach him. So whether it's ESAs or impeachment, Abbott and Paxton both uh, have these vendettas against a lot of House members, but sometimes that puts them uh, at odds in these individual races. And look how unusual this is. You know, we're used to the Republican Party having some infighting going on, but it's usually behind the scenes a little bit. But this cycle, we've seen these feuds within the Republican Party, like, wide open. Like, you know, it's very public, there's so much acrimony, we're just not used to seeing it so openly and so raw in this kind of format where you literally have Repu Republican on Republican going into the primary season and they want everybody to know it. Yeah, and yeah. Jeremy, I could ask you the same question. Uh, do you think Ken Paxton's endorsement will have some weight when you think about the typical Republican primary voter? Yeah, the typical Republican primary voter is a small number, right? We know from history that Republicans just, don't, you know, nobody votes in our primary, really, you know, in, in comparison to how many voters we have. We have one of the lowest primary participation rates in the nation. It's because it's so early in the year. And so that tells me, the, the, the voters who are going there are the most hardcore Republican voters that you right. have out there. And that is the one area where Ken Paxton might have a little influence. Like he can get to the Republican Party events, mm -hmm. you know, where the Republican executive committees have meetings regularly. They're the ones who are for sure going to be voting. And thus their vote becomes a lot more, uh, a lot more than your, your average, you know, garden variety Republican who, you know, maybe comes in every now and then. Those people aren't going to be nearly as prevalent. So that's a long way to say, yeah, Ken Paxton will have an influence on this base of Republicans who might just be at a poll uh, enough. They might be angry enough about it to really have some impact. Mm -hmm. And we can't forget about the Democrats. Ryan, I know you did some <laughs> reporting on some of the surprises that we saw under uh, after filing deadline. Uh, big primary news in the Democratic Party. Victoria Niave Criado is challenging the very liberal Democratic senator from Dallas, Nathan Johnson. Uh, Neava Criado is a very respected and effective member of the House, the chair of the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus, and she says that the incumbent Senator Johnson um, is not doing enough to stand up to the Senate GOP. She specifically criticizes him for a vote he took on a, a human smuggling bill that increased uh, the penalties for human trafficking. And she says that amounts to a racial profiling bill, and she's going to stand up for the, the Mexican-American community up in uh, Johnson's district. We'll see how that race goes. Johnson, at least at, at this point, is the odds on favorite and just in terms of the money. Well, and remember that primary, particularly for the Democrats, you know, Joe Biden clearly is not going to have much of a challenge. You know, there are two challengers out there. That means even fewer Democrats mm -hmm. coming out to vote. There aren't going to be many people who ultimately get to decide that race. There's just not enough active Democratic primaries in Dallas, Fort Worth to kind of make that a big turnout type of an election. So this is a race that really could come down to just a handful of Democrats. And that is like anybody's game. Absolutely. You know? All right. Ryan Chandler, Jeremy Walls, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. How much did Ken Paxton's impeachment trial cost Texas taxpayers? We got the receipts, how it compares to the proposed settlement, and why the state may need to pay even more. A Texas Supreme Court decision pushes a Dallas mom to flee the state to get an emergency abortion. Why that order could have an impact on other women challenging the law. The Texas Supreme Court blocked a Dallas woman from getting an emergency abortion, but the court's order in that case is raising other questions. Kate Cox sued the state after she was unable to terminate her pregnancy after getting diagnosed with a fatal fetal abnormality. After having complications, her lawyers say she was forced to leave Texas in order to get an abortion. While the opinion focused on Cox's case in particular, it could have an impact on other legal challenges linked to emergency abortions under the law's exceptions. 
when is the medical exception really going to allow life-saving medical care. A lawyer representing Dallas mom Kate Cox is unclear on how the Texas High Court's ruling will impact future mothers. There ought to be an exception to save the life of the mother, to save the fertility of the mother. Austin Kaplan is also an attorney on Zorowski versus Texas, a group of women suing after they couldn't get abortions despite severe pregnancy complications. I'm personally hopeful that this is a sign that in the Zorowski case we will get a positive decision for for, for mothers, for doctors. The state's abortion ban provides an exception when a pregnant woman has a condition that places her at risk of death or poses a serious risk of substantial impairment of a major bodily function. Monday's opinion reads, if a doctor using her reasonable medical judgment decides that a pregnant woman has such a condition, then the exception applies. Legal experts say the opinion's language may give physicians more clarity in the future. So this is not a ruling that Cox could have benefited from. Rather, this is a ruling that uh, uh, we think that, that the other doctors might be able to use to perform abortions in the future if certain very specific conditions are met. But as we heard in the Zorowski hearings this summer, many Texas doctors are choosing to do nothing, fearing penalties under the law. I've always tried to practice within the standards of care, but I also want to be a law-abiding citizen, and I don't want to risk my, my freedom, my livelihood. Texas law allows private citizens to sue doctors if they believe physicians are violating the law. Penalties can be steep, starting at $10,000 in damages. Doctors can also lose their licenses or even go to jail. And some doctors say it's not clear when Texas law allows exceptions to the abortion ban. It's a key issue in the Zorowski case before the Texas Supreme Court. 20 women are part of a lawsuit against the state. Many of them say they faced similar medical emergencies to Cox, and that state law prevented their doctors from acting until they nearly died, while some were forced to carry their baby to term only for their child to quickly die. Their central argument is that the law is too vague when it comes to what is considered a life-threatening or serious risk for a pregnant woman. The state argues the law clearly says when exceptions are allowed and that they should sue doctors instead for malpractice. The Texas Supreme Court has not ruled yet in that case. We're getting our first glimpse at how much Ken Paxton's impeachment trial cost taxpayers, why the early numbers are raising questions and concerns. And later, the state says it's finally making progress to help people mistakenly kicked off Medicaid. What's changed to help unclog the backlog? We're now getting our first glimpse at just how much the Senate impeachment trial of Attorney General Ken Paxton costs taxpayers. We don't have the final total yet, but the early numbers are in the millions. It's already more than the proposed settlement that the AG's office worked out with the whistleblowers. House lawmakers refused to pay the settlement, choosing instead to investigate Paxton, which led to the impeachment trial. Now, news of the cost is bringing questions and criticism. Millions of taxpayer dollars have been wasted on this impeachment. Since the day the trial ended, Attorney General Ken Paxton and his supporters have called for an audit of all costs associated with the impeachment. While the audit is not complete, records we obtained are giving us an idea of the cost to the state with figures for the House's outside counsel. Rusty Hardin worked the most. With 400 hours at his 500 per hour rate, he made about 200,000. And the money wasn't just for the two weeks of trial work the lawyers did here in this room, but also in the hours of labor on pretrial motions and briefings in the months leading up. Other costs include about 10,000 on notebooks and more than 36,000 on transcripts. When you're on the spot in trial, you don't have time to say, Your Honor, can I look that up for a second? Thousands upon thousands of pages of copies, plus the binders that the copies go in. Legal experts say these numbers are what you would expect for a trial of this significance. For a trial of this size and with the kind of legal talent that they put behind it, that's not very surprising. But the numbers are still drawing criticism. In a statement, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick says the House spent taxpayer money like drunken sailors, noting the Senate spent roughly 435000 total, but the Senate didn't have to pay for legal teams. That's actually more surprising number than a $3.3 or $3.4 million fees number. If, if you asked a typical trial judge in Texas how much money they spent preparing to try an important case, they'd say none. 
We still don't know how much money Paxton's defense team got paid, but it wasn't public dollars. We didn't get a dime from the state. I reached out to Chairman Andrew Murr, who led the House impeachment. He sent a statement defending the cost. Murr said, quote, the future of Texas's governance rooted in trust and transparency justifies this expenditure. This week, the lawsuit that prompted the impeachment of Attorney General Ken Paxton will be back in court. It's part of an ongoing fight by the whistleblowers, Paxton's former top aides who reported him to the FBI and were subsequently terminated. While the case was settled at the beginning of this year, the legislature did not approve the $3.3 million payout. That prompted the House to begin investigating Paxton. And on Wednesday, a Travis County judge will hear the whistleblower's request for a deposition, which, if granted, would compel Paxton to give sworn out-of-court testimony. A federal judge is contemplating whether to hold the state of Texas in contempt of court again over ongoing problems in the Texas foster care system. Judge Janice Jack could slap the state with a fine for not following some of her court ordered reforms. It's the latest chapter in a lawsuit that's lasted for more than 12 years. Investigator Avery Travis listened in on the testimony and looks at what's next in this long legal battle. Pictures show dirty, damaged, and disorganized rooms inside rentals in Temple, Killeen, and Belton, housing Texas foster children with some of the highest behavioral and medical needs. Pictures filed in a report ahead of a hearing in federal court revealing dozens of children spent nights in these kinds of unregulated placements this year. But the grim picture painted by witness after witness in that hearing, using only their memories, gripped a Texas courtroom for three days. Hopeless former caseworkers remembered nights working harrowing overtime shifts, watching kids at these kinds of placements. And an 18-year-old girl offered tearful testimony about inappropriate advances from an adult staffer and other poor treatment during her seven years in the system very dangerous problem areas that that remain um, even after all these years. Paul Yetter, one of the lead attorneys who originally filed the lawsuit on behalf of thousands of children in the state's care, told the judge they've seen little improvement from the Texas agencies tasked with finding homes and investigating reports of abuse or neglect. Leadership from the state agencies involved told the court that they've made improvements, lowering the number of children without placement, as well as prioritizing staffing issues that could potentially put pressure on the system. Now, the judge has held the state of Texas in contempt twice before during the course of this lawsuit, so all eyes are looking to her, waiting on any ruling. Avery Travis for State of Texas. We reached out to both the Department of Family and Protective Services and the Health and Human Services Commission for comment. They pointed us to the private attorneys now representing the state. Those attorneys have yet to respond to our requests. We told you a few weeks ago how attorneys for the children wanted the judge to put some parts of the foster care system under a court appointed administrator. Attorneys now tell us that the judge indicated she would not grant that request. Thousands of Texans looking for help after the state wrongfully kicked them off Medicaid. People are making really hard choices right now about do what do they spend on Christmas gifts? Do they fix their car? How are they going to pay rent? Why there's now some encouraging news about efforts to restore those lost benefits. Earlier this year, the state kicked more than a million Texans off of Medicaid without first checking if they were eligible for coverage. Thousands of them are still waiting to get those benefits restored. And the process can take months as workers face a big backlog of applications. But now some encouraging news. Investigator Matt Grant found the state's overtime push is beginning to unclog the backlog. It's concerning at any time of the year. It's even more um, heartbreaking. Um, at the holidays. Help still isn't coming fast enough. That's according to a new report from a coalition of children advocates and nonprofits, including every Texan. Stacy Pogue is a policy analyst. So people are making really hard choices right now about do what do they spend on Christmas gifts? Do they fix their car? How are they going to pay rent if what they need to do is pay for you know, health care or food? Since pandemic era Medicaid protections ended in April, the report found Texas only processed 3% of data-based automatic renewals. That's the lowest rate in the country. Last month, 39% of Medicaid applications took longer than the 45-day federal requirement to be processed. 
and 1.1 million Texans were dropped due to procedural problems. There were some errors, com errors in the computer programming in the system for eligibility that was kicking folks off when they shouldn't be. The study also highlights our reporting, which found last month 150,000 people were waiting longer than 45 days and points to new data showing more than 48,000 Medicaid applications have been sitting untouched since March. To tackle the backlog, the Texas Health and Human Services Commission is encouraging employees to work overtime this month and increasing training. Those efforts appear to be working. Officials report the average time it takes to process an application dropped this month from 120 days to 36. HHSC spent more than five and a half million dollars in overtime in September and October and more than 27 million since last year. Officials say they were approved to hire more than 600 full time staff and say they're moving aggressively to reduce the backlog and implement new strategies, not just with Medicaid, but also federal food benefits. Matt Grant, State of Texas. Whistleblowers within the Texas Health and Human Services Commission have pushed the state and federal leaders to take action to reduce the backlogs. In September, we told you how they sent a letter to the governor highlighting issues within the system with staffing and leadership. Congressman Lloyd Doggett, a Democrat from Austin, published the letter and he and other lawmakers have called on federal regulators to intervene. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Monica Madden. We'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.